G'day everybody, how are you going today? It is so good to see you and thank you for joining me for the latest, the latest wrap around the interwebs for photography and movie making news. It's been a bit of an exciting week which starts with Olympus or do we just call them OM? OM systems have come out of nowhere with the new OM1. New old? Have we had an OM1 before? I'm not sure. Someone who knows more about Olympus, let me know. Some of the highlight specs are is that it is a 20 megapixel micro four thirds sensor and it is a stacked BSI sensor, which pretty much everybody seems to be getting into. It also shoots up to 4K 60 in 10 bit recording in both DCI and UHD formats or sizes. It shoots 10 frames per second with a shutter by the look of it, but up to 120 frames per second with an electronic shutter. And an exciting move from a focusing perspective is it shoots quad pixel phase detection. So they are some of the high level specs and for a little bit of Olympus's marketing hype at the crossroads of image quality, portability, speed and reliability, the OM1 from OM System is a flagship mirrorless camera built for adventure. Characterized by its versatile micro four thirds platform, the OM1 meshes quick and nimble stills performance and apt 4K recording with unique computational imaging tools and a hardy, dependable physical design. Compared to the previous generation of processor, the TruePic X offers three times faster processing speeds along with the 120 frames per second readout rate for faster, more responsive shooting. The processor also contributes to a wide ISO range and quick continuous shooting rates. Native sensitivity range is from ISO 200 to 102,400. Expandable down to an ISO of 80. Yeah, 200 is pretty high for a base native ISO. Continuous shooting up to 10 frames per second with full time AF and AE and a buffer of 169 raw frames when working with a mechanical shutter. If working with the silent electronic shutter, 20 frames per second shooting is possible with full time AF and AE and a buffer of 108 raw frames. Now they're suggesting here that the image stabilization, the five axis image stabilization will give up to, it says here, this advanced sensor shift system compensates for seven stops of camera shake with the body alone. And an additional stop is provided with selected IS enabled lenses. So they are talking potentially up to eight stops of stabilization. That's a heap. That's so much. And something that a couple of little details I'd like to point out here. They have a thing called Live ND, now supporting up to ND64, six stops. This unique function digitally simulates the effect of an optical neutral density filter for producing long exposure shutter speed effects. And another one I like the sound of here, this is pretty interesting tech, live composite, perfect for long exposures, nighttime shooting and light painting applications. This unique mode gradually builds up an exposure over time without overexposing key elements within the frame. This mode works to not only record newly detected light source over time and allows live view monitoring as the image develops. A handheld live composite mode is available too. Now this is interesting tech. This is certainly tech I would like to see in my camera of choice. Now there is 4K recording, is supported up to 60p or 10 bit, 420 sampling, full HD recording is possible at high speed rates up to 240 frames per second for slow motion playback. 12 bit raw output is supported via the micro HDMI port when working with the optional compatible external recorder, such as an Atomos Ninja 5 or Ninja 5 Plus. This is an exciting and interesting release from Olympus slash OM Systems. It's great to see they are still there. I'd love to hear from you out there in the comments who is still interested in buying a new Olympus camera, an OM System camera. 
in 2022. Western Digital reports that there has been a contamination in their facility and they have lost a massive amount of new storage. 6.5 billion gigabytes of storage has been contaminated. Now, Western Digital owns Western Digital, SanDisk, G Technology, recently been rebranded to SanDisk Pro, and they also own HGST storage brands. They're basically saying that they are working very, very hard to get their facilities back online and to get storage flowing again, but there is some concern that it may affect SSD costs for the next three to six months. Western Digital's partner is Kioxia, I think is how you pronounce it, and they account for 32.5% of overall NAND flash output. Yeah, it's a significant impact on the market, but it just shows there is memory in so many things that we use uh, now in our modern day lives that this has a real impact on manufacturing. And we already know that silicon manufacturing in general is under a great deal of strain. So none of this helps. We have a first with the Fujifilm X-mount lenses being released. We have beautiful looking 16, 30 and 56 mil. Sigma did indicate that, or there was rumors that Sigma would be releasing lenses for a new mount. Some thought, some hoped it might be for the Z or for the R mount. But in both cases, we were incorrect and it's for the Fuji X mount. Now, these lenses are all coming out as we can see in April and they certainly look like beautiful lenses. And as we can see, they do have no aperture ring on them. We will find more out about these lenses in the future. Well, this certainly is an exciting time when we have OM as well as Panasonic both coming out with some pretty similar cameras. And here from Panasonic, we have the GH6. Now the GH6 looks like a very powerful little camera and it even has an active cooling system built within. As we can see, it's a 25.2 megapixel sensor. It is micro four thirds. It can shoot 4K 50, 4K 60, as well as 422 10-bit in 4K. It has a next generation sensor. The Lumix G86 features the first 25.2 megapixel live MOS sensor in micro four thirds. The new sensor offers our highest dynamic range and features a no low pass filter design, delivering impressive ultra realistic detail and sharpness. In a first for the format, the sensor can combine dual simultaneous readouts of high and low gain circuitry, producing higher dynamic range range with improved detail in highlights. They have a new processor which they call the Venus engine and also the processor now supports recording in Apple ProRes HQ internally to CF Express cards. Now it's CF Express Type B, which I am personally particularly excited to see. I do think CF Express Type B is slowly but surely becoming the new SD. The camera also offers unlimited video recording, specifically designed to offer unlimited oversampled 4K, 50 and 60, 10 bit 422, both internal and external recording when used within the recommended operating temperatures, with which as we can see are pretty broad here to, from minus 10 to 40 degrees centigrade. So that is over 100 degrees Fahrenheit. It has very, very high frame rates, pushing the boundaries of mirrorless cameras, producing high quality, high bit rate, slow motion. The G H6 offers variable frame rate recording in full HD, 10 bit, up to 300 frames per second. The first Lumix G series camera to feature a tilt and free angle rear monitor. The monitor can be rotated even with an HDMI or USB cable attached to the camera, allowing greater flexibility when viewing the monitor while connected to an external recorder or other devices. Double memory card slot for flexible data management. The Lumix GH6 supports high bitrate video recording with a double memory card slot for a CF Express card Type B, as I stated, and SD memory cards. And as a little caveat, as we can see here, if you want to go for the highest bitrate options, you do need to be recording to the CF Express card.
We can see it's small, it's light, and it's rugged. This looks like an exciting little camera, and well, it's coming in at a pretty good price. The price that you're seeing there at the top of the screen is actually the Australian pricing. HDMI Type A, boom, full-sized HDMI port. We love that. Next in Canon news, it seems to be the case that Canon, like Nikon, are slowly removing more of their old DSLR lenses from being current. Now, this has been going on, and it's going on for, as I said, both of these manufacturers, and also there is some further Sony news about their DSLR system coming shortly. But yes, more and more lenses are being removed from the Canon DSLR line of lenses. And this plays into the ongoing discussion that I think companies who have had a foot in either camp, DSLR and mirrorless, are simply accelerating their exit from DSLR. Now I know there are tons and tons of people out there that are happy with their DSLR systems, they're going to stick with their DSLR systems, and that's completely cool. Nobody is suggesting they should move to mirrorless. No one is asking them to move. No one wants them to move. If their equipment is working and giving them the results that they want to, and that fits use case, budget, and legacy, which means your wallet and perhaps the ton of lenses you have in your cupboard, well, that's absolutely perfect. Stick with it. But from everything that we can see, the sort of stuff that's going on with cameras these days, they're turning into really high-end computers that don't have much going on in them. Even shutters are starting to be removed. They're basically a sensor, a processor, and storage, which means that the old system of having a mirror flapping up and down and a shutter moving, they are less flexible, there's less that you can do with them, whereas these modern systems, there is more that you can do with them computationally, in firmware and so on. And I think they're cheaper to make. They're cheaper for the manufacturers to make as well. A camera without a mirror box and without a shutter definitely would be cheaper to make. So ultimately, that is where the industry is going, and it's no surprise to see the latest news from Canon in regards to further lenses being made obsolete and the upcoming news that I'm about to talk about from Sony. It would seem that Sony has now finally signaled the end of the A-mount by announcing the fact that all of the A-mount lenses are now discontinued. So if you want to buy any A-mount lenses and they're still sitting in stock in your favorite store around the world, now is the time to grab them because once that stock is gone, there will be no more stock to fulfill it. Now, Sony states here that they will continue to support that equipment for some time to come, but no new further systems will be made or lenses will be made. The last camera that was announced for the A-mount was the A99 version 2, and that was in 2016. So we are now talking six years since Sony has done anything new for cameras in the A-mount system. Further to that, the last A-mount camera that was manufactured was in May 2021. So we can see, we can see even when the last camera comes out in, in any system, and that was 2016, it took another five years before they stopped producing. So camera companies go on a long time, even when they've kind of made a decision to stop. Really, the only other thing that Sony has done in this space for A-mount users was to create an adapter that allowed you to use the screw-focusing version of A-mount lenses on the E-mount system, and that came out in around mid-2020. But, as I said before, DSLR, the cost of maintaining and building DSLRs is, from my perspective, I think going to be more expensive. And let's face it, where the future is, is mirrorless, shutterless, and then you have these basically computers, which through firmware you can just continue to evolve. In further Sony news, Delkin has announced that they will be creating a CF Express Type A card. They are now the third manufacturer to come into this space, but they are still ridiculously small and very, very expensive. The two cards that they're creating are an 80 gigabyte card and a 160 gigabyte card, and the prices are going to be 
much the same as the current Sony prices. We love CF Express, but there's a great gap now appearing between CF Express Type B and CF Express Type A. Now, it has taken, I suppose, a long time for CF Express Type B to gain traction and to become cheaper. Back at the start, 2012, I think, when I first got one, an XQD, to go into my Nikon D4, file sizes were nowhere near what they are today. We weren't shooting 4K or 8K, we were only shooting 1080p, and cameras were not shooting 50 megapixels at 30 frames a second, like the A1. So it's confusing to me that Sony, who's created the first version of this format, the CF Express Type A, yet, and, and presumably they could make a larger card if they want to, they're still sticking to 160 gigabytes, which is pretty damn expensive. It's great to see a third player in the market. The more players in the market, the more ultimately it'll drive price down. So we can only hope that that begins for all camera systems that are using Type A. And is it only Sony at this point that's using Type A? Please let me know in the comments below if there's anyone else out there, any manufacturers using CF Express Type A. And in news that may or may not be related to Nikon, who knows, we've often talked about Tower Jazz as potentially a creator of sensors for Nikon. And who knows, maybe they even make some of the processes that sit inside some of the cameras that we use. But Intel is to acquire Tower Semiconductor for $5.4 billion. In a press release that can be found on the Intel website, and we will put a link below right here, and thanks to Nikon Rumors for pointing this out for us, the transaction creates a globally diverse end-to-end -end foundry to help meet growing semiconductor demand and brings more value to customers across the nearly 100 billion addressable foundry market. Jeez, it's big, it's big, isn't it? The acquisition accelerates Intel's path to becoming a major provider of foundry services and capacity globally, now offering one of the industry's broadest portfolios of differentiated technology. This highly complementary transaction brings together Intel's leading edge nodes and scale manufacturing with tower semiconductors, specialty technologies, and customer first approach to deliver leading technology and manufacturing capabilities and enhanced value to customers globally. You know, I'm not sure if we can read anything into that in regards to what Nikon and Tower have been up to. Tower has always certainly felt like a more boutique foundry. So there we have it. There continues to be lots of interesting news around the web and things keep happening. There's always more news. I can't report on all of it. There's so many little things going on here and there. But this was some of the things that were of interest to me. Please let me know in the comments below what do you think about all of this. And I look forward to seeing you again very soon with perhaps some more images from the 400mm 2.8 VRS TC Super Epic Prime lens from Nikon. Great work, Nikon. All right. If this is your first time here, it has been so good to see you and I would, I would love to see you again. So please do subscribe, please share and please like. And don't forget to check out my website at mattirwin.com. All right, bye for now.